Good evening, and welcome to the Albright Scholar for December 2019. My name is John Pankratz. I teach history at Albright, and each month it's my privilege to welcome BCTV viewers and residents of Greater Reading to take a glimpse inside our learning community up here on North 13th Street, to look at the work being done by teachers and students, and to think about its impact on all of us. It's good to be back. We've had a hiatus uh, uh, during October, the Oktoberfest, occupied your attention. I hope drew some contributions as well. Uh, in November, there was a hockey game uh, broadcast during our slot, uh, but it's now December and we're back. Uh, it's final exam week uh, at uh, Albright, and so students are stressing out, uh, cramming in some last minute studying and trying to do as well as they can to finish the semester strong. Uh, there's a, a late night breakfast being served tonight, and I think all three of us are going uh, over that uh, to that to, uh, to help as well. Outside, it's cold and drizzly, uh, but we're going to take a flashback in time. We're going to go back to this summer uh, when uh, these two scholars uh, participated in what we call the Albright Creative Research Experience, an acre uh, grant. And I've been hoping to have you on for the last four months to tell, <laughs> tell me about it, uh, but finally we're here. Uh, on my far left is uh, my dear colleague, uh, Beth Keister, uh, professor of sociology uh, uh, here, and you've been a guest on the show multiple times before, uh, often talking about your uh, collaboration with students. Yeah, this is my third, uh, my third collaboration with a student um, here at Albright in just the past six years. Great, great. And we appreciate that, and I appreciate you your being on the show. And then Stephanie, Stephanie Pinnell, who has been just a bright spot in the uh, <laughs> Albright firmament, uh, firmament for the last uh, three and a half years, and uh, a senior who's just about to graduate in three yes. and a half years, and uh, a political science and sociology. A dual major. Yes, yes. I'm very excited to be here. I'm very excited to finally discuss some research that we, we were very eager to conduct this summer. Right. Well, you, uh, I know it was a research right, right on the border, borderline between uh, political science and sociology and, uh, and that sort of thing. And we're going to be talking about electoral politics. But let me just mention that uh, in the meantime, Stephanie has passed on to the monarchist side of things, uh, becoming Albright's homecoming queen <laughs> yes. uh, back at the end of September as well. So c congratulations thank on you, that. Thank you, thank you, thank <laughs> you. It was very pleasing. <laughs> well, I think viewers of uh, uh, the Albright Scholar know that uh, the Acre is an opportunity to miss out on summer vacation or a summer <laughs> job and instead become a really serious researcher. Uh, why would you want to do that? Um, I think that the biggest part of wanting to conduct research, especially with faculty who I really look up to, mm -hmm. um, it really aids yourself in becoming more of a professional um, in the sense of learning how to speak a new language when it comes to mm -hmm. scholarship, what to, yep. to develop programs that or develop research that gen genuinely aid your way of becoming a, more of a professional yeah. um, because it, it allows a level of maturity because you have to be able to work with your professor who is no longer your professor, but someone you're researching with, in a sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you get to develop a relationship that is almost a requirement when you're going into the work field. If you don't know how to develop a work relationship with someone who you look up to so or someone... So many tasks in the world yeah. require collaboration. Exactly. And so okay. I, that was one of the biggest reasons. And I'm also just so genuinely interested in the idea of what our acre project was. Right, well, we're certainly going to get to that. <laughs> uh, Beth, just in the abstract, you said you've uh, worked with at least three students on acres. Uh, uh, what's the appeal from the, the faculty member's point of view? For me, it's watching them grow, watching them develop, um, uh, having students who I can, I can partner with, um, who just bring ideas to me that I go, sure, let's give that a try. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if I even mm -hmm. know anything about that, but um, I'll take what I know. Let's take your passion, what you're interested in, and let's see what let's see what kind of trouble we can get into. Yeah, yeah. I I, I know that at some uh, probably at every undergraduate institution there is some sort of program that aids student research. But I think very often it's the student following the professor's agenda uh, that there's a larger project and they say, well, the student can be part of it and be a helper or contribute. But the acre at Albright is, is different from that. Uh, 
where did you come up with your idea? And then we're going to talk about the idea itself. So um, to talk about the the creation of this idea and this project, we have to jump back to spring of 2017, 2018. Okay. Um, so a few years ago, I was in Dr. Keister's uh, research methods class, and we had to do a literature review on some th any topic under the sun. Mm -hmm. And I always found it fascinating how colors um, really affect the idea of politics. So I found research in this nature, and I submitted this literature review to Dr. Keister. And once we got our grades back, I saw at the end of the paper, I saw, hey, maybe this could become an, an acre project. And I shot Dr. Keister, I was like, oh, so what's an acre project? Like, this is blah, blah, and all these things. And really, it just manifested from there, and I, it became something bigger than that little mm -hmm. literature review I did. It was wow, this actually is very effective and this could actually be a bigger idea and all these things. And, and lo and behold, we... Yeah. we, we so it came out it. of your genuine curiosity and the energy and skill that you brought to that literature review. Mm -hmm. And you recognized in Stephanie that mind that could, could really carry this forward. I did. I, because of the interdisciplinary nature, because of the collaborative nature where we really give students um, a chance to lead on a research project, and because I do teach a research methods class, um, I do like to encourage students and say, if, you know, if, they, if, their, if their projects, their, senior, their, fi their final projects show potential, I like to say, let's go one step further. Let's actually conduct the research. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have to confess that uh, my notion of uh, American politics uh, dates back uh, before you two were born. And I remember watching the Kennedy-Nixon debates in 1960, and they were in black and white. There was no blue or red in, involved in that. Uh, and yet you fastened on these two primary colors as uh, something that defines a political landscape these days, at least on the electoral maps, and that you know, very often divides the political landscape in, in really polarizing ways. Oh, yeah. And we actually found in um, in our research, Dr. Keister found an article that the uh, whole phenomenon of these two colors is actually a relatively new phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, it dates back to 2000, mm -hmm. um, where actually that was when blue became associated with Democrats mm -hmm. and red became associated with Republicans. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, red, white, and blue have always been sort of affiliated with politics as we think about the colors of America and democracy. Um, the colors of many countries, Holland <laughs> and, and France as well. Sure, and so so um, electoral politics and, and elections have really always focused on red, white, and blue. Um, it just wasn't until um, kind of the contentious uh, race between and, and the, the closeness of the race between um, Gore and Bush mm -hmm. um, that the newscasters at the time, um, particularly particularly on NBC, really started to lock into this idea that blue would mean Democrat and red would mean um, uh, Republican. Uh, mm -hmm. Even Reagan, when Reagan won, it was called the blue wave um, right. because the color wasn't necessarily associated. Um, but what we find is that since 2000, this, this association has grown and... And all the television outlets have adopted mm -hmm. that same symbolism to explain the electoral map. Absolutely. So the use of red and blue states, t even talking about red, right. and blue, red and blue states, or the way voters, uh, red voters, blue voters, um, we hear a little bit about purple, mm -hmm. purple states to mean swing states. Swing states. Um, where, the, where the state could go either way. Um, but that, that what Stephanie's interest really was, was to take it a step further and say, um, how, how have these colors become socially constructed? How have we mm -hmm. attached meaning so that red means Republican and blue means Democrat? But more than, more than that, it means values. So, so blue means pro-environment, pro-choice, pro-diversity, um, uh, whereas red is associated with more conservative or Republican, um, um, anti-abortion uh, anti uh, and pro-gun rights, right? That all those values have also become closely associated just by simply mentioning those colors. And those, and those associations live in people's minds. Absolutely. Yeah, it's not simply a media phenomenon. It's been internalized. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's also research that um, says that 
when you contextualize colors, so for example, if your favorite color is red, mm -hmm. you're most likely contextualizing it in a sense of love, flowers, roses, Valentine's the idea of passion, Day. Valentine's yeah. Day. And when you're, you're not thinking of the negative connotations um, of blood, murder, these things, um, even with the color green, you're not thinking of vomit, um, mm -hmm. what you're thinking of nature, money, and all these things. So the way you contextualize certain colors then affects how you perceive these certain colors. So then our research dove in more into the idea of how these political contexts, how these affect the, the contextualized um, definitions of these colors, okay. and then see how if there's any relationship between that. Right. How does one research this, this topic? <laughs> uh, I can understand how you do a literature review, but how do you get at the internalization of these yeah. associations? Um, so we developed a survey, um, okay. and so we developed uh, research that uh, studied um, the idea of how, how, how do you study the idea of colors and how someone perceives people. Um, so we developed a survey that focused on the ideas of traits and emotions as well as uh, using photos of uh, white men um, from the 100th and 11th House, House of Representatives, just Nin so. Yeah. Nin oh, okay. 19 19 1980s, we picked, yeah. we, were, we picked real elected politicians. Mm -hmm. But from some time ago. Yeah, so there wouldn't okay. be, so there wouldn't already be a sense of association or familiarity as, as if you were to use Hillary Unless Clinton you or Bar yeah. Barack, <laughs> Barack Obama or, or Donald Trump that people already have formed opinions about. I think Mitch McConnell was in the Senate in the 1980s. <laughs> it's possible. Yeah. We definitely, we didn't use his picture. Okay. Um, okay. But we did use white men um, just so there and they were in the majority in, yes. in the um, Congress in the past. For numbers as well, because there's not as many um, in the past, but we also used it just to um, kind of set back limitations of okay. uh, sec uh, sexual, like sexist uh, in intentions or racial intentions. And so that, <laughs> that was a level that we could remove from the biased uh, notion of certain participants that may have occurred. Yeah. So we also made sure things like the candidates were all smiling mm -hmm. and appeared friendly okay. so as not to give certain people an advantage over somebody with maybe a more stern look. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. the pictures were black and white uh, to make sure there were no other colors in the picture um, except for we would then take the pictures and set them on a red, white, or blue background mm -hmm. to determine which, which picture would um, evoke a sense of electability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, also we used, uh, we've listed certain traits and uh, emotions, um, and we put the colors red, white, and blue, and which of the emotions and traits uh, was most associated with which color. So for example, um, for traits, competence, leadership, and likability, mm -hmm. and et cetera, um, how would these colors then be contextualized? How do you see them? What color are they perceived as in your, of, of these three sets? Okay. Um, and so then we developed those, that number as well, um, as well of our demographics that we received. Um, we had 44% um, were Democrats mm -hmm. um, of the thing, uh, and then with 20% being Republicans. They had self-identified yes. in, in that way. And these were people from the uh, broader Reading community or uh, people nationwide or people at Albright? Um, we did a national. Uh, it was a national. Uh, we got people from California. Um, with we had about 128 surveys um, that we could use, mm -hmm. um, all ranging from states uh, using Mechanical Turk on Amazon. It, it's oh, okay. an Amazon. It's an Amazon service that mm -hmm. um, allows you to recruit people nationwide that fit a particular criteria, um, who. Um, we are then able to compensate them uh, 10 cents per survey, things like that, to, to kind of compensate. So, um, yeah, we talked to, we, we got results from 128 people um, mm -hmm. in about a two week period. Again, okay. this, was, this was a summer research project. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and again, fairly widespread party, about 60% women, 40% men, um, it was 64% white, so it was, it was um, slightly skewed in that particular sense. Um, but first and foremost, we found that 77% of the respondents did identify blue with Democrats and 76% okay. um, identified red with Republicans. So, so that's been learned. Yeah, our mm -hmm. respondents, even though this is only a 20-year-old phenomenon, clearly understood this association mm -hmm. moving forward with the rest of, with the, rest of the survey. Right. And then they were able to take the survey online, electronically, mm -hmm. so all of these colors and then all of the images as well as the traits, yes. 
were the, then presented in that sort of ordered form. Yes. Nice. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then so after doing, conducting all these research um, and developing, um, getting all these data back, um, we did find that um, the uh, certain traits of competence, leadership, and likability, and the emotion of sadness was in fact associated with the color blue, mm -hmm. um, whereas traits of dominance, persuasion, anger, fear, disgust, contempt, and jealousy were all associated with the color red. Um, so Across we, the line. Yeah, yep. so we Just, found, yeah. Yeah, for the entire, for the entire pool, so um, that alone it kind of just reaffirms what we already what the, what we already understood is that um, these colors are socially constructed that that a group of, of random people can, will perceive these these electability traits and these these emotions in a very similar way. That that is fascinating, but some of those associations might even predate the the political convention. Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Uh, what was more interesting was when we actually then started to break apart how the Republicans felt versus people who identified as Republican and people who identified as Democrat and and their their own um, perceptions of those same traits and those same emotions. Um, we found that actually they had um, an inverse relationship. So to explain, we found that um, the traits that were associated with blue generally were actually, Republicans actually associated them with red. Um, so we found that Republicans actually saw anger, disgust, and jealousy as blue, um, and likability and competence as red, whereas Democrats was the inverse of anger, disgust, and jealousy as red, and likability and competen uh, competence as blue. So we did find that there was, um, there was two separate associations when we took a weight and disaggregated the two uh, political parties, and they mm -hmm. actually had two different uh, perceptions of these colors oh, and emotions. Did, did the takers of the survey have a, a pretty clear idea of what you were looking for as, as they took them, or did you surprise them? <laughs> Not necessarily. I wouldn't say I know they... in psychology uh, uh, tests, of course, they're never looking for what they say they're looking for. There's right. always a and, and I think what yeah. we I think what we told people is we were we were looking to understand um, what makes a candidate electable. Okay. It okay. was something more generic. More neutral. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it was when we first showed them the pictures on the colors that we were sort of priming them to um, uh, make them be in a political context. Right, so we wanted them to start thinking about red and blue. White was sort of our neutral color. Um, we wanted them to start thinking about them in that political context, because like Stephanie said, the meaning of red could change whether you are picking roses for somebody that you love or you're in a hospital covered in blood. Right, so we put them in the context first. Mm -hmm. And so that then when we were simply asking them about these, these electability traits and these emotions, and we were asking them to pick red, white, or blue um, with no other colors on the screen, we were trying to um, demonstrate that putting them in a political context is what would shape how they felt about these particular these particular phrases. That's very interesting and very very useful. Uh, did you come up with takeaways from this uh, research? Remove colors. <laughs> um, that's essentially we found that if you one of my biggest capstone uh, and our biggest capstone of this whole thing was that you know th there's a divisive political world it's that we're seeing. We see that the rise of social media, the rise of uh, polarized news stations, of the idea of fake news and all these things, mm -hmm. we see a more polarized uh, country. Um, and with taking the idea of colors and kind of removing the contextualized idea behind them, you wearing a blue sweater, me wearing a red sweater, is not going to inherently... Like we planned it, isn't it? <laughs> is not going to inherently have a, a false um, a false perception of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and we found changing colors maybe every 10 years or anything in the sense of... Or maybe we could all wear black, white, and yellow floral prints, <laughs> for example. I'm on board. Okay. Uh, I... That's probably not a bad idea, mm -hmm. right? Or just all be purple. Yeah, everyone yeah. be purple. Mix that could the be two. fun. <laughs> that could be fun. Uh, is is there going to be a, a sort of a public or or published uh, uh, result that you're you're going to produce? 
Um, well, currently, yeah, we're hoping. <laughs> uh, currently, I, we are uh, submitting our article here and uh, there to, to hopefully be published. Mm -hmm. um, and in March, we're also presenting at the Eastern Sociological, Sociological Society. Society. I mess that up all the time. Yeah. Um, so we'll be presenting A there meeting as well. in Philadelphia. Yes. Oh, how great. Yes. Good. So other people will get to weigh in and ask questions and, and, and learn from you as well. Yep, we hope Good. so. Uh, I mentioned that you're graduating uh, in December. You'll have your diploma. Uh, what are your plans going forward, Stephanie? Um, yes, so I, uh, I, I recently just got hired. I'll be working at with the Penn State University of Abington Branch, so mm -hmm. I'm very excited about that. Um, and just excited to move forward, you know. It's, I cannot thank this this program specifically. I, I emailed Dr. Keister as well. Um, Can you be one of my references, please? Uh, all these things. And I, I, I emailed her and I was like, I, I truly can't thank you enough because the ability to just speak um, really was helped me this summer with this research, so I'm excited for that. Yeah, and I bet you wrote a good letter of recommendation, <laughs> didn't you? I had a few nice things to say. <laughs> well, because you knew so much about Stephanie and, and all of her capabilities in all sorts of situations. It's yeah. true. I can, I can say so much more about a student that I've had this ability and this opportunity to work with, and mm -hmm. and you know we really started this program, this this project from the ground up. Um, we took over a couple of whiteboards um, over the summer, and we we mapped out ideas, and we put signs on it that said "Do not erase under penalty of death," <laughs> um, and just we would sit back and 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 look at the ideas, and 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 Stephanie's input was was invaluable. She truly was a. Uh, a, a co-collaborator. Mm -hmm. um, this was definitely not me telling her, just go do this on my behalf, which is what so much of, of undergraduate research is. It and, can be. And, and why I'm, um, so, which is why I like the ACRE program so much. Yeah, I do too. I do too. Now, Beth, you're, in January, you're going to be down in Ecuador, right? I am a uh, different a different uh, learning opportunity. Um, we this have is, uh, a, a, a interim course that now has been going for a number of years. Today, uh, this is the tenth year. It's mm -hmm. kind of its ten year anniversary. Um, started by a, a colleague in the sociology department, um, and he's leading it this year with uh, a psychology professor. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to tag along for part of the trip, learn about what it means to lead a study abroad, so that I can. Um, lead the study abroad the following interim. Great, and work on your Spanish. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'm going well, to do what I can. I'm going to do what I can. <laughs> great, great. Uh, unfortunately, you're going to miss the uh, regional K uh, Kennedy Center Festival, where your uh, family member <laughs> is going to be appearing in a, a, a very precious cameo. I, I do. I um, I got involved with our beloved Domino players um, with their most recent production of the Curious Incident of the Dog at Nighttime, um, where my dog is the dog, not the dog. <laughs> no, it's not the title. It's not, dog. It's not the title dog, um, but he does make a, a cameo appearance in the in the play and. Um, Provides a, a little bit of, of intermission therapy for the for the domino players as well. Yeah, well, this is this is again this is second year in a row that we've been invited to uh, to festival, and it's uh, it's quite an honor. Uh, I know that some of you at home are wondering what this white stuff is growing on my face. That has a theatrical output as well. I'm going to be in uh, the domino players' next production of Pedro Calderon de la Barca's uh, wow. Life's a Dream. <laughs> Uh, but we can talk about that on a future episode of The Albright Scholar. Beth, Stephanie, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thanks thank for you. having us, John. We'll see you in 2020.